I'm very happy to welcome you to uh, Symposium 27. Uh, the idea to put together this symposium was uh, driven by the fact that there's a lot of uh, literature on trauma and psychosis and its connection. And uh, there's a lot of epidemiological studies showing the connection. And, but there is so far not much knowledge regarding the mechanisms linking trauma and psychosis. So we tried to put together a symposium where there would be some background and some data on, uh, on epidemiological uh, data, but also some people talking about the connection, how the mechanism could be uh, either psychologically or uh, at the level of uh, uh, neurobiology. So we, we tried that. There's some knowledge, not much, but we tried to put these pieces together to make sense of this connection. So I will not waste much more time of this interesting uh, topic. Um, and uh, I will welcome the first speaker, uh, who's Helen Fisher. She's very well known for many studies she's published. She's working at the Institute of uh, Psychiatry in London, and she's going to talk about uh, childhood trauma and the onset and outcome of psychosis. What is the evidence? Great. Thanks so much for staying after lunch. Okay, so I'm just going to um, very briefly uh, introduce you to the idea of an association between trauma and psychosis. I think we're very well aware of that, but I'll just cover it incredibly briefly. Um, and then I'll move on and tell you a bit about some of the work we've been doing uh, looking at particular childhood abuse and outcomes of psychotic disorders over 10 years. Okay, so just very quickly, um, I just want to make the point that childhood trauma actually is a big umbrella term that covers actually a huge amount of different types of adverse experiences, normally up to the age of 17 or 18. Um, so classically, people have tended to look at physical, sexual, and emotional or psychological abuse and neglect, um, but it also obviously covers things like bullying by peers, um, separation or death of a parent, um, as well as witnessing to violence in the home. And it also uncovers things such as exposure to war or natural disasters, um, as well as serious accidents. So it's really important for us to think about all these different terms that we're using, um, and hopefully all the speakers will be quite clear about um, what specifically they're going to look at. Um, in terms of prevalence, unfortunately, these things are, are much more prevalent than we would uh, wish them to be. So this is some work um, done in the UK a few years ago from a nationally representative sample, suggesting that maybe even a quarter of children um, experience some form of maltreatment um, in childhood, and often that's through uh, forms of neglect. Is it going to work? Am I pointing it in the right direction? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can keep going. Okay, all right. Uh, <laughs> we will see if we can get on. Um, and unfortunately, maybe up to two thirds of, of kids are actually victimized by uh, peers of a similar age, um, with things like sexual abuse actually occurring in this sample quite more commonly by um, peers than by um, certainly by parents. Um, maybe a quarter uh, witnessing domestic violence in the home, and maybe up to two thirds of, of kids actually witnessing. Um, violence within their own community. So as I say, these are actually quite high rates um, and they obviously occur at different levels of, of severity for children. Um, and we can think about maybe timing and, and severity as, as potential um, ways into thinking about mechanistically what might be important. Um, but the point really is that all of these different um, types of trauma have been associated with quite a wide range of mental health and physical health um, problems. Um, and in the last sort of decade or so, people have really started then to turn their attention um, to psychosis as the only thing that people hadn't really um, looked at in this area. So in our own work, we've shown that um, uh, different types of victimization, particularly rather than broader trauma, um, are associated uh, with different levels of psychotic phenomena. Um, so in children, this is a study of um, twins, uh, longitudinally, showing that um, being bullied by a peer or maltreated by an adult were associated with an increased risk of, of psychotic symptoms in childhood, um, and not surprisingly, having multiple types uh, increased the risk even further. 
And the interesting thing about this study as well is that we looked at um, kids who'd been exposed to severe accidents and found that they only had a very small elevated risk um, for these phenomena in childhood. And our impression of that is perhaps it's not to do with the fact that they weren't physically hurt, they often were, it was quite serious accidents, but perhaps there was no intention to harm um, involved in, in that. Um, and that might be something that's important we might want to think about in terms of psychotic experiences. We've also shown, as with many other people, that um, particularly forms of abuse are associated with um, psychotic disorders at the clinical level. Um, and in this particular study, um, we found that uh, physical abuse from a mother figure uh, was particularly associated um, with having a clinically relevant psychotic disorder and to a lesser degree emotional abuse from mother. And that might be potentially something to do with um, the breaking of a potentially more strong attachment bond uh, between the child and, and their mother, um, leading to a lot more distrust generally, and maybe hot, hostile attributions. Um, but it could also just be that actually in this sample, we had quite a high rate of parental separation. So um, in a lot of these cases, the dads actually weren't around to, to perpetrate, perpetrate abuse. So well, be thankful for that, I guess. But it kind of reminds us that we, when we're thinking about mechanisms, we need to think about what else is happening in these samples. And this is a slide that we've shown many times at this conference and other conferences um, by Felipe Vorez and others um, showing a meta-analysis of the association between uh, different forms of, of childhood uh, trauma, particularly abuse and bullying, um, and just the presence of uh, psychosis. And you can see here, um, this is by uh, using different study designs, different types of outcomes, uh, whether they be psychotic disorder um, or more psychotic experiences or symptoms in general populations. So I think we, we're kind of happy that there is an association with the presence. Um, I'm definitely not going to say it's causal in any way. There's very little evidence of that. Um, but in terms of outcome, we're less clear. There's a lot less studies that have really looked at well, when someone has psychotic symptoms or a psychotic disorder, what's the potential um, association with abuse and, and what happens to them through the course of, of their experiences. And this is important, as we know, and again, something we hear about a lot. We know that. Uh, a large proportion of individuals who go on and develop a psychotic disorder will have a persistent or relapsing course, um, but thankfully maybe even up to sort of 20% of them may only have a single episode, and many more of them, although having persistent symptoms, go on and achieve functional um, recovery and, and find a way to, to get on um, with their lives. So it's really important, um, as well as thinking about the etiology of onset, to also think about well, what are the risk factors that might be associated with either a, a worse or a better outcome so we can think about ways to intervene um, once people have got disorders um, to hopefully change the, the trajectory of that course. So in terms of existing literature in relation to, to child's maltreatment, which might be one of the um, things that's involved in this, um, some of the literature suggests that those who've been abused might have longer um, hospital stays, um, they might be more likely to relapse or have worse social outcomes, um, perhaps less compliant or are more likely to have suicide attempts um, and perhaps have more severe and more positive um, psychotic symptoms. And there's been a small meta-analysis of the um, studies looking at the persistence of symptoms at least, both in uh, psychotic clinical populations as well as in, in the general population. Um, and this uh, found a very small association between having experienced forms of um, abuse and, and other types of trauma and having uh, longer um, experiences of symptoms. But as you can see, there are very few studies compared to the, the big uh, Varese one for just the presence of psychosis. Um, and inevitably, some of these studies have quite small samples. They're often convenient samples, depending on, on who they could find. Um, they're often relying on very brief uh, retrospective recall of, of trauma, which can be problematic. Um, and have quite heterogeneous outcomes of, of how they measured um, psychosis. So it's really important for us to, to do some more studies and, and get a better handle on this. So that's what we tried to do. Um, and this is data from the ESOP study, the etiology and ethnicity of schizophrenia and other psychoses. Um, and this is a, an epidemiological study that tried to recruit um, all cases of um, psychosis that presented for the first time, both in South London, um, Nottingham up here, and for a short time also in Bristol in the UK. Um, and these were people that presented between 1997 and 2000. So it's important to note, because of the time period, these people, when they went into care, did not access early intervention services. This is 
prior to the, uh, uh, the actual implementation of those services in this country. Um, we also selected a random sample of healthy controls, but I won't focus on those today. Um, and these individuals were assessed both when they first came into services for psychosis and then followed up um, 10 years later to see um, what had happened to them. So in terms of our measure of childhood abuse, so we used the Childhood Experience of Care and Abuse Questionnaire. We did that as an interview face-to-face -face, um, with individuals, and this assesses quite a wide range of different forms of um, abuse uh, as well as supportive relationships in, in childhood. Um, it involves both screening questions and much more detailed probes to really get at well, who was perpetrating, when did it occur, um, what was the severity of the experience. Uh, it has pretty good psychometric properties, including uh, in people with psychosis, um, and has published cutoffs, so we can really pick um, just the individuals who are exposed to, to more severe levels. So for physical abuse, we're excluding things like just being smacked occasionally on the bottom, but we are including things that are, are more involved with a serious injury or threat um, to life. And we can think about whether it makes a difference, perhaps. Okay. And as I say, these individuals were... so that. The abuse assessment was done at baseline, and we followed these individuals um, up at 10 years. Um, so a rather large team of, of researchers went out and tried to trace them um, and interview as many of them as they could um, from the London and, and Nottingham sites. Um, so where they could, they did face-to-face -face interviews. They also got informant reports, if they could, um, as well as obviously looking through clinical case notes um, to get even more information. And they covered also the clinical course um, across the 10 years, the social outcomes, um, functional outcomes, um, and also the use of, of services during this period. And all the information, which was very, very vast, came back and was um, consensus uh, by a group of very senior clinicians and academics. So when I present information on course, people have sat and thought very carefully about that consistently across the sample. So in terms of the subsample that um, this analysis is based on, it's just over 200 individuals uh, from this larger sample who had completed the abuse uh, interview at baseline. Um, and of those, we had data, there was no data available on 34 of them. Uh, 12 of them, unfortunately, had died in this period, so we have, don't have interviews with them either. Um, six of them were abroad, and we couldn't um, get hold of them. Uh, and three of them were excluded because we realized retrospectively they didn't meet um, the inclusion criteria for the study. So the data is based on 159 cases of, of psychotic people with psychotic disorder. Um, about half of them are male. Uh, at presentation, they actually had a mean age of 31, which is a bit higher um, than you might find for early intervention services in these areas now, um, but ranging from 16 to 62. Um, about half were white British, about a fifth were um, of black Caribbean origin, um, and about two thirds actually had non-effective forms um, of psychosis. Um, and a third of them reported um, severe instances of sexual, physical, or emotional abuse um, during childhood. And obviously this is a subsample of the larger one, and we checked, and there are no significant differences demographically or clinically between our sample and, and the full sample. So in terms of clinical course, um, here we have um, individuals who uh, were classed as not having been abused um, during childhood in yellow, and those who had severe sexual, physical, or emotional abuse um, in adulthood or in, re uh, sorry, in childhood are in red. Um, and in this box on the right here, you can see that actually there's very little difference between those who were classed as being abused and not abused in childhood um, in terms of uh, having continuous psychotic experiences during these, this 10-year period, um, having periods where um, they had remission for at least six months of the symptoms and then had subsequent episodes um, of six months or less, so episodic course, um, and an intermediate um, course that we're calling neither here, um, where they did have periods of remission, but they also had periods um, of having psychotic symptoms, again, that were much longer than, than six months. So there's no difference between the groups for that. However, there was about 13% of the sample who actually had a remission of their overt psychotic um, symptoms within six months of presenting. Um, two services for psychosis, and thereafter actually didn't have any further episodes as far as we could tell um, from the interview and, and case note data. Um, and actually this group has a much greater proportion of individuals um, who reported abuse in it, 
Um, and digging into the data a bit, um, this group um, who had experienced abuse uh, were much more likely to be women um, and to present with a very acute, uh, effective form of psychosis. So it's perhaps not surprising that they fall um, in this remitted group. In terms of other outcomes, um, those individuals who had uh, been classed as having been abused in childhood were unfortunately more likely to have um, quite severe symptoms during the follow-up. Uh, they were much more likely to have attempted suicide, and I think that fits with quite a lot of data from general population samples as well, um, and more likely to have self-harmed. And they were much less likely to be employed um, by the 10-year follow-up as well. However, we didn't find any differences, perhaps surprisingly, in terms of substance misuse, uh, maybe because that was quite high generally in the sample, um, or antisocial behavior, no differences in the likelihood of, of having died in this period or in terms of relationships. So obviously it's important to acknowledge limitations of this work, although it's one of the bigger um, studies that's out there, it's still quite a small sample, um, and it's obviously much uh, smaller than the original sample, so we need to think about um, missing data and, and dropout and how that might bias um, the results that I've presented. Um, it's obviously incredibly difficult to assess these outcomes over 10 years um, when you're looking back and you spend a long time with a big calendar trying to work it out, but it's, it is not obviously an exact science. Um, and there obviously are problems with reporting abuse retrospectively. Um, I struggle to remember what I ate for breakfast yesterday, let alone uh, what happened to me 20 years ago. Um, so there are general problems with recall bias, but obviously it's complicated um, by individuals with psychosis who by the nature of their symptoms are potentially not able to distinguish between, between what's real um, and isn't real. Um, and some of the work, however, we've done um, in this cohort suggests that individuals with psychosis can reliably report um, abuse over quite long periods of time, up to seven years, um, and also when you ask them in different ways with different measures. So it should at least be reliable, if not um, entirely valid, but I think we could say that of, of most people's reporting. Okay, so let me just um, finish by summarizing. So as I say, about a third of the sample had experienced severe physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, um, which is uh, relatively in keeping uh, with the literature from clinical samples. Um, those who had uh, been classed as having abuse during childhood were slightly more likely to remit um, within this period. However, obviously, the majority of them did go on um, and have uh, continuous or episodic uh, forms of psychotic disorder. And I think importantly, the, and, and not surprisingly, the patients with a history of abuse were at greater risk of, of self-harm and suicide during uh, the follow-up and also um, were le less likely to be um, employed. And I think that again speaks to um, the importance in early intervention and other services of, of screening for, for trauma um, in individuals with psychosis um, and maybe thinking about um, the risks uh, that they might have and maybe thinking about adapting um, care packages to, to deal with that and maybe they require more vocational and educational support as well. But clearly we would want this to be replicated in, in quite a lot more um, epidemiological samples, um, obviously with um, more people as well. So I'll just um, finish there by acknowledging obviously the, the people that gave up their time to actually uh, come and see us originally when they were um, not feeling perhaps at their best and also to, to re-engage with us 10 years later. Um, and also the study teams at both phases who worked incredibly hard to, to recruit and to assess um, people and, and particularly Professor Craig Morgan who led um, the study uh, follow-up and all the other investigators who were involved um, throughout the sites. So thanks for your attention. Yes, thank you. Thanks for your talk. Uh, we've got a few minutes for questions. Any questions about this talk? I, I have one or two questions. But oh, okay. did, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned, I heard that before as well, that um, mothers, I mean, being abused by mothers would have uh, a higher impact. Did you have any, I mean? I mean, I, mean, I, think it could, I mean, I think that's one theory. I think there are, as I say, in this data, there, there are other explanations that are probably more likely. I, I guess there's a 
a more traditional explanation that um, often, but clearly not always, mothers may have a stronger bond with their child. I think it really depends on um, the family situation. Um, and it may be something about if, if the mother, in, whoever the more strongest attachment figure is, abuses the child, that that very basic trust that the child has in, in an adult, if that's broken, that that might be more problematic. Um, particularly for them. So I don't think it's necessarily um, has to be a mother. I think it could easily be someone else. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess traditionally that's the person that they would have had a stronger attachment with. So I think that's one of many um, explanations okay. that you could have. I, I'm curious whether there have been studies about the type of psychotic experiences that might be seen in people who, more likely in people with trauma, thinking of just some anecdotal observation that we've seen more uh, florid positive symptoms, mm -hmm. you know, auditory hallucinations and so on, less thought disorder, less mm -hmm. negative symptoms. Um, one, something of an exception to that is a recently, recent case with a uh, very a prominent thought blocking, which seemed, and this is very clinical speculation, uh, somewhat continuous maybe with the experience of dissociation. That she, uh, and this is in a adolescent girl with a history of sexual abuse. Curious whether yeah. how this has been I mean, I think there's, there's been less work looking at specific symptoms. Um, there is quite a bit of work from Tony Morrison and Richard Bensel and other people looking at that. The, the associations tend to be a little bit more gauged towards sexual abuse and hallucinations, um, but people have also found associations with delusions slightly less with negative symptoms, but there are one or two studies that have found that. Um, but I think, as with this study, the reason we don't present the symptoms often is that it's quite difficult once you get down to that level to really look at the dimensional stuff and people are experiencing different correlated things at this point. But yeah, but I think it's important. I think as, as much as um, thinking about the different forms of abuse and the, obviously the co-occurrence of different types of trauma, um, also, yeah, w what's more specifically here, I don't even present by effective and non-effective, let alone by, <laughs> by symptom type. But yeah, I think there are some suggestion, there may be some specificity, and, but we need to really think about it a bit more carefully. There was just one more question, just the last quick question. Hi, thanks for this. I, um, I'm a child psychiatrist, and one of the things that I've wondered about is that these kids with early trauma, with psychosis, do you find that their diagnosis remains schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or do you find that those diagnoses change over time after 10 years? So, I mean, in this sample, the youngest person we had was 16 who had psychosis. So I can't really comment on the early people. I mean, certainly within this sample, we do see some change, but they're really more in adulthood. Um, but you certainly do see some, and, and one presumes that you would see more change nowadays with, certainly in the UK, early intervention services tending to want to give a psychosis, NOS diagnosis to people and, and not often giving a schizophrenia diagnosis early. So there is some fluctuation, but I, I'm afraid I can't comment on the, the kids. In the, the study I showed briefly, um, those are kids in the general population who have symptoms they don't have. Maybe one of them had um, an actual psychotic disorder, but most of them had other issues. Okay, thanks again very much. And, uh, And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Luis Alameda, who's a psychiatrist at the Department of Psychiatry in Lausanne, Switzerland, who's going to take, talk about uh, age at a time of exposure to trauma modulates the psychopathological profile and the impact on functional outcome in early psychosis patients. It's a long title, but he's got uh, only 20 minutes, actually. Thank you very much, Philippe. So, as you said, I will talk about one specific aspect of traumatism, which is the, the age, the time at exposure, and how it can modulate some of the outcomes in psychotic patients. So, as it has been many, many times shown in this uh, Congress, but also just by, by Helen Fisher, that there is a link between trauma and psychosis, and that also that there is a link between trauma and some of the outcomes in psychotic patients. But then we can also look to a specific variables that can modulate this, this, this link. For example, the cumulative effect is important, the type of exposure is important, and also the time at exposure, the, the age at exposure. In this slide, uh, Jim Van Hoes was showing in this uh, figure 
that <coughs> psychosis is a neurodevelopmental disorder and that there are uh, biological uh, processes but also psychological processes that develop during the lifespan and that trauma uh, examining the different environmental risk factors, how, how they impact in these biological but also psychological processes may help us to understand some of the mechanisms that are leading to the disease. So <clears throat> what has been shown in terms of the, the age at exposure to trauma in different settings? This is in general population settings and Kelly was showing in, in adolescents that this is an old study, but one of the first ones that I found, that he was examining the, the question of the timing. He showed that <clears throat> in 565 patients, that, uh, subjects, that those exposed to, to abuse before the age of five had more adjustment problems in the childhood and in the early adolescence. In this study from Glasser in 90 healthy volunteers, uh, he showed that uh, um, those who were uh, traumatized before the age of, of 10 they had more emotional reactivity to daily life stress compared to non-exposed, and this difference was, was smaller in those exposed after 10. At the level of uh, imaging studies, there is this group from Teicher in Harvard University who does a very, very nice work, and they look at different critical periods of vulnerability in the brain, looking at different uh, volumes of uh, structures in the brain, and they look at how they can vary according to the, eye, the, the, the exposure uh, at different times. They look, for example, they see that amygdala is particularly sensitive to exposure between 10 and 11 years old, while in another study, in the hippocampus, subjects that were exposed to trauma between three and five had a smaller hippocampus volume. So at different sensitive periods, uh, according to, to when the trauma uh, can uh, impact in, this, in these regions. In terms of the risk for developed psychosis, uh, Dr. Fisher has already shown uh, before this study, uh, folk, uh, where, where she, she, saw, she, she, she have shown that uh, uh, when physical abuse committed by the mother occurred in childhood, uh, the, the, effects of, uh, the effects were much higher than when the same abuse occurred in, in adolescence. As you can see the old ratio there. So, the earlier the trauma is, the higher the risk is to develop psychosis, and also in other settings we see the same, the same tendency. So at an at a animal model level, in, in Kim's Doe laboratory where I work as a clinician, uh, we have shown that uh, paravalbumin cells, and Daniela will talk about this later more in detail, paravalbumin cells we are involved in the disease, they are particularly sensitive to trauma uh, to, to oxidative stress in mice uh, when uh, the stress is applied in childhood and in, in per peripubertal ages, but not in adulthood. Okay, so this is leading to this following working hypothesis. This is a working hypothesis which says that <clears throat> in the development of the disease, there is an interaction between genetic vulnerability and environmental risk factors that interact during the development leading to an impairment of microcircuits and macrocircuits, so myelinization and paravalbumin cells, and that this uh, lead to the disease. And then the timing at which these environmental risk factors occur may determine which brain regions and neural circuits will be affected. And this could somehow explain uh, some of the psychopathological differences that we observe in the disease. And also maybe some of the differences in terms of severity of the disease. This is published in, the, in, those, in those papers. <clears throat> so according to these elements and to the fact that in, uh, little is know about, uh, known about how the time of trauma can modulate uh, the, the outcomes in, in prospective settings of early psychosis patients, and wanna, uh, we wanted to examine this in a sample of early psychosis patients followed up during three years. If the age, we wanted to examine if the age at the time of exposure to trauma modulates its impact on the psychopathological profile and on the functional outcome of patients. We hypothesized that patients exposed to trauma before 12 will suffer from a different psychopathological profile and from a greater functional impairment than non-traumatized patients, while this will not be the case for patients exposed after 12. So the methods. Patients were recruited between 2004 and 2010. 
in TIP program, which is the treatment and early intervention program in psychosis in Lausanne, we led by Professor Philip Conus. The inclusion criteria for getting into the program is being between 18 and 35, living in Lausanne, so in the French part of Switzerland, uh, and being, uh, meeting the threshold criteria for psychosis according to the CARMS, and then we don't take in, uh, in charge the patient that have uh, more than six months of antipsychotics, that have a uh, psychosis related to intoxication or a QE under 70. The sample is, uh, I will show you, in fact, three different studies, but the samples are between 196 and 225, more or less the, the same sample. Uh, some patients had to be excluded for methodological reasons that I will explain. So the design, this is a three years prospective study where, uh, of, of an early psychosis sample. Uh, and then we have three groups of patients. We have the early trauma group, uh, those who are exposed to the first traumatic experience between birth and 11 years old, the late trauma group, those who are exposed between 12 and 16, and then the non-exposed group, okay? And then we measure different outcomes. We measure the premorbid adjustment scale, it's a retrospective scale, uh, that where we can measure the academic uh, performances and the social performances in the premorbid phase. And then during the follow-up, we have eight measurements occasion. So we evaluate eight times the patients during three years, and we evaluate them with those instruments that I will explain in details. So the instruments are the, the PANS, so we have the positive and the negative domain for, for symptoms, the Yomani already scale for mania dimension, the Montgomery Asper depression scale for, for depression, SOFAS for, for, for the functioning, not including the symptoms, and then the GAF also include the symptoms on it, and then the premorbid adjustment scale with the academic and the social scores that can be extracted and then we evaluate trauma. We also use the CTQ in our, in our, in our study, but uh, the CTQ that does not measure the age, the time at exposure. So this is a problem for what we wanted to, to do. So what we do is <clears throat> we use this tra trauma, we call it simply trauma table, and this is a kind of, kind of a, a life events table. And then the case managers who follow up the patients during three years, so in TIP program, the same case manager follow the same patient during three years, they must explore the exposure to those experiences. They do not do it in a, as a self-report uh, or like a, with a single interview, but in, in the frame of a trust and relationship, because they are their, their therapist, they, they have to explore these, these issues based on a, on a clinical setting. So th this is how they can say if the patient had been exposed to sexual physical abuse on those exposures in the premorbid phase, in the prodromic phase, in the intrapsychotic phase, and then they have to say the first uh, exposure. That's why, that's how we stratified patients in childhood, so early trauma and late trauma, according to the first exposure. So we don't take into account the repetition of the exposure in our study, eh? so it is the first one. Okay, so the statistical analysis, in order to see if the trauma early or late predicted higher levels of symptoms on a functioning, we use a random intercept model, which takes into account the longitudinal structure of the, of the, of the, of the study. And then we introduce trauma category early and late as predictors, and then we adjust it by different covariates, uh, substance use, lifetime, but also intermittent, sorry, intermittent age, sex, and socioeconomic age status. So the demographics, I forgot to say something. We excluded patients that had been exposed to a first experience of trauma during the promorbid phase and during the psychotic phase. So those patients were excluded. So they are only patients that were exposed in the premorbid phase. So they, are, they have uh, 24, it's a typical early psychosis sample, 24 years old. And they, they're mainly men, so 70% of men. The baseline level of functioning were 36, and then they, they were mainly schizophrenics, so 60% of schizophrenics. And there were no differences in those, in those variables in terms of the trauma group. And you can see 44 were exposed to trauma early, and 18 exposed to trauma late. What about the psychopathological outcomes? So, 
early trauma patients, when compared to non-trauma patients, they had more positive, negative, depressive, and manic symptoms, as you can see there, okay? So they had higher level of symptoms overall in all the dimensions. The late trauma group, when compared to non-exposed patients, they had only more negative symptoms. So they had the same level of symptoms in the positive, in the depressive, and in the manic, but they had more negative symptoms than non-exposed patients, okay? This is the same, just illustrating with figures. As you can see, in blue is the early trauma, in red is the late trauma, in green, non-trauma. As you can see, in the, in the positive and the, the depressive and the manic, is always the early trauma, which is upper, while in the, in the negative dimension is the only dimension where the late trauma has more symptoms. What about the functional uh, outcomes? We, we measure the with the premorbid adjustment scale. In this study, we use the sexual physical abuse. In the other study, there were also the neglect, neglects were included in the trauma group. Here, it's only sexual physical abuse. So in the left, you have the premorbid scores. You have childhood and, and early adolescent social and academic scores. And patients put to trauma, sexual physical abuse early, they have in childhood poorer social but not academic scores, and, and they have also, in the adolescence, poorer social but not academic scores, okay? And then patients post to trauma later, in the adolescence, they do, do not display uh, poorer functional levels in the premorbid phase in childhood compared to non-exposed, because they are exposed to trauma later, and then in the adolescence, they had also, they showed, poorer, premorbid scores in the social, but not in the academic domain. This is a bit, a bit, a bit complicated to explain, but I hope it was clear. Um, so the trauma leads to uh, impairments in the social, premorbid scores, not the academic. So patients do well at school, but it's in, it's in the relationship that they are impaired. What about the functional outcomes during the follow-up? So these are the models in, in the three years of treatment. Patients put to sexual physical abuse early, they had lower level of functioning in GAF, measured with GAF and with SOFAS. Patients put to trauma late, they did not have a different with non-exposed patients. Okay, here you can see this is the early trauma group, and the late trauma group, it has that at the same level that the non-exposed group. So only early trauma group had long-lasting functional impairment. What does it all mean? And now we want to try to, to, to understand a little bit what's the link between trauma and these and this, this findings, uh, this uh, impairment in the, in the outcomes. So <clears throat> this, is, this is, I'm not trying to answer to this question in this talk, but I will I just give you a little bit of a new study that we are preparing, it's not submitted. So what's the link between trauma and functioning? What's the link between trauma and symptoms? And Babington have shown in a very recent review that in psychosis you have, of course, the psychotic symptoms, hallucination, delusion, uh, thought disorder, but we have also the, what I call the ancillary symptoms, that non-psychotic symptoms like dissociation, depression, and anxiety. Huh? And he suggests that this non-psychotic symptom could mediate the link between adversity and psychosis. Okay, based on this, as in, the, in my study, we show that early trauma led to depressive symptoms and that early trauma led also to impairments in the functioning and that depressive symptoms are known to, to have an impact in the functional outcome. We, had, uh, we wanted to, to, to look at if the, the severity of depressive symptoms mediate the impact of trauma on the functional impairments of patients. So this is, gonna, this is what, uh, <clears throat> what we examined. With mediation analysis, we examined if there was a mediation between trauma and functioning by the depressive symptoms. We did, we did, we did this analysis after every measurement occasion, so after 2, 6, 12, 18, 24, 30, 36 months, and we found that there was a mediation, a total mediation of the depressive symptoms uh, on the link between trauma and functioning after 30 and 36 months, okay? For GAF and for SOFAS. I will show you 
one example, what we found for GAF after 60. So there was a total effect, a direct effect of early trauma on GAF, but not from late trauma on functioning, as was shown before in the previous study. And then when we introduce the depressive symptoms in the, in the model, we see that there is an indirect effect. So that early trauma leads to impairment in the functioning, and this, this impairment in the function, higher level of, of, sorry, higher level of depressive symptoms lead to impairment in the functioning. And this is not the case in late trauma group. Okay, and then the, the effect that we had, it was significant before, disappears when we introduce the depressive symptoms in the model. And it means that there's a total mediation. And we found the same results with GAF after uh, 30 months, and also at, after 30, uh, 36 months with GAF and with SOFAS. So, summary, <clears throat> patients posed who, are, who are exposed to trauma before 12 have poorer functional impairment and display higher level of symptoms overall. Patients exposed between 12 and 16 years old uh, presented more negative symptoms than non-exposed patients. This is an intriguing fi finding. The age at exposure modulates the link between trauma and positive, depressive, and manic, but not for, negative, not for negative symptoms. So negative symptoms, both early and late trauma patients had higher symptoms. The impact of childhood trauma on the premorbid phase of psychotic disorders seems to be restricted to social domains and not to the academic domains. The effects of early trauma on functioning was completely mediated by depression after 30 and 36 months of treatment. Some implication about these results. The age at the time of exposure should systematically be examined and it can, it can strongly modulate later outcome in psychotic patients. For example, in the mediation analysis, if we put all the trauma patients together, we will have not found this mediating effect. It's only when we stratified patients that we found it. Intensifying pharmacological and psychotherapeutic treatment focus on the depressive dimension may help traumatized patients to improve their functioning. More studies investigating other possible mediators between trauma and symptoms and between trauma and functioning in psychosis are needed. For example, dissociation and also this has to be replicated in terms of positive symptoms. And then this is to introduce Daniela that we will give a, a background into the biology, the mechanism that are behind this. We could suggest still that early insults may differentially affect circuit connectivity compared to later insults and leading to different clinical phenotypes with this different potential for recovery. Of course, they must be further explored in future. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Luis. Any question? Yes. Oh. Run down the aisles. Thank you. Hi, very interesting. Uh, I just want you to ask how you tease apart the fact that the people with early stress might have been chronically stressed or like might be exposed to stress, to, to trauma for a longer time, how would you differentiate that this is not a time, not only like a, like a vulnerability period uh, effect, but a chronicity mm -hmm. or accumulative uh, type of uh, chronic trauma? Yeah. Of course, this is a limitation of our study. Uh, yesterday was an oral session where they showed that uh, the, the says if the trauma stops, the effects stops also, so it's the, the, the uh, ongoing trauma which predicts the outcomes. In this study, unfortunately, we, we could not, uh, we could all of only focus in the, the, the first exposure. We don't really know if the patients are exposed again, and we know trauma predicts later exposure, so probably those who are exposed early have later exposure, and they are also exposed in the adolescence. So we cannot really be, be yeah, this, this could be also a, a case in some of the patients that this the cumulative effects that predicts the outcomes and not the first exposure. This is a limitation, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, just to add something, to, because uh, we collected the data together, it's true, I mean, we don't know also if it's the mother or the father, I mean, it's, uh, so we should maybe make other studies where we actually identify all these factors that come out, come out. but at the time we started the study, we didn't know all that, so, but there's need for more detailed assessment. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Gr uh, great work. Thank I was uh, wondering, because uh, there is data that if you have depressive symptoms at the start of the psychosis uh, at presentation, it's actually uh, a predictor of a better outcome. But with your cases, if you have a traumatized early psychosis patients, um, the depressive symptoms uh, predict a worse outcome. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have looked uh, at a, a differential effect of depressive symptoms in traumatized and non-traumatized early psychosis patients. Mm. You, we, we, what we saw is that uh, in terms of depressive symptoms, th those who are traumatized early, they have higher depressive symptoms compared to non-exposed, and uh, those exposed later had also didn't differ uh, in terms of depressive symptoms compared to non-exposed. Then, uh, but about, uh, about the question of the, the baseline level of depressive symptoms that can uh, be a factor, a protective factor, we haven't looked at that in our, in our sample. Um, it's true that we were wondering why our patients uh, only had this mediating effect of depression after 30, 30 and 36, and not in the beginning. One potential explanation is the insight that improves during the, during the follow-up. At, at the beginning, higher levels of, of insights somehow, uh, yeah, they, avoid the, 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 the link between, between depressive symptoms and impairments in the function, and then they are more aware about their illness, the depressive symptoms have higher impact. So insight is a variable that can be also playing a role in these dynamics. One other question. Thanks for a great study. Um, Thanks. So. I just I glimpsed the um, the rates of childhood trauma, and they seem to be a bit lower than they generally are in um, in these kinds of groups. So I wondered. I wasn't sure, but I wondered if you could speak to that. Sorry, I, I didn't understand the the beginning. Uh, the the rate of childhood trauma um, in the group. It looked like it was well under fifty percent. The right. <laughs> huh? Prevalence. Ah, the prevalence. Prevalence, sorry. Ah, sorry. Uh, it's a, it was around 30%. Around 30% in our sample, they were exposed to one of those experiences. So sexual, physical abuse, but also neglect. Okay, so we, if we take into account sexual and abuse, it was like 28. So they are lower rates than in England, for example, in Switzerland. We don't really know why, but uh, we are lower, at lower rates, yeah. Okay, but uh, I think it's important just to really be precise on the fact that we uh, uh, we focused on uh, on some uh, subset of trauma, so sexual and physical abuse and neglect, but not others. And sometimes studies report on, on all exposure, and uh, because we wanted to be sure this was uh, real trauma that, uh, without discussion, would uh, would affect people. Like in the scale of uh, trauma, we also uh, of life events, we also had divorce of parents and all that. And some studies include these, and we wanted to to focus only because we, uh, in the beginning, didn't have a, a full scale to assess uh, the response of patients, the, the rating of the patients in terms of what impact it had on them. So it's sort of a narrower focus, which might explain the slower rate. Okay, thank you very much. And I, it's my pleasure to uh, call on stage uh, Daniela Dvier, who's a neurobiologist. Actually, we, we're lucky enough to, to be working in Lausanne in close connection with uh, the Neuroscience Center as the program uh, led by Professor Kim Do. And we have tried to do a lot of work together to really do some translation. So uh, some of the ideas to look into age uh, at the time of uh, trauma and its impact on patients stemmed from actually observations made on the animal model uh, on which Daniela is working with Kim Do. So she's going to uh, make the link backwards. Thank you.
So hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here today to ah, excuse me to present you uh, my work. Uh, so I will try in this study, uh, we try to do the parallel between uh, human studies that were presented before, so by Luis Alameda, for example, but of course that are already uh, presented in literature, and animal model uh, for schizophrenia to try to understand the mechanism that uh, are the underlying mechanism uh, of, um, of that mediate actually this link between trauma and uh, the appearance of the symptoms of schizophrenia. So. This study uh, is called Early Life Insults Impaired by Valbumin Interneurons via Oxidative Stress Prevention and Reversal by n acetylcysteine and Environmental uh, Enrichment. So in the laboratory of Professor Kim Do, we are working on the hypothesis that uh, environmental factors uh, by the interaction with some genetic vulnerability will induce uh, impairments in the, these uh, following systems. So the dopaminergic uh, system, the glutamatergic system uh, with the NMDR re receptor uh, hyperfunction, the redox imbalance, and inflammation. And actually, all these systems uh, interact and converge to, the increase, to increase oxidative stress. And so this oxidative uh, stress then can lead to some impairments in microcircuits, uh, so which are actually the uh, connection of the, ne the network connection inside the brain region, uh, so where parvalbumin interneurons are uh, involved in, but also in macrocircuits, uh, which is a connection between different brain regions through uh, oligodendrocytes and myelin. And so the impairments of these two circuits uh, can lead to integration and connectivity uh, impairment that are observed in patients, and this may account uh, for the symptoms and dimension that are described in uh, this disease. And so what is really crucial, as um, uh, Louis Ahmed has showed you before, is the occurrence of these impairments during the development. And so indeed, and these environmental insults uh, when occurring at some uh, developmental periods when the brain mature and depending on the timing, this will affect some precise uh, cell type or structure uh, that are vulnerable to these insults during the maturation and this will lead to uh, the si different symptoms that are observed. And so today I will focus on the redox uh, and inflammatory uh, system and how they can uh, induce impairment in the microcircuits, more specifically on parvalbumin interneurons, and uh, with a special focus on the development. So first, uh, indeed, redox dysregulation has been described com uh, as being involved in schizophrenia pathophysiology. Uh, so this uh, red oxidative regulation is uh, depicted as increased oxidative stress on one hand, but also decreased antioxidant in the other hand. And one antioxidant that has been shown to be involved in schizophrenia is the glutathione. So this tripeptide is a redox regulator um, and uh, also so an antioxidant, and it will um, protect the cell from damage by reactive oxygen species, but it will also modulate uh, some protein function. And so in schizophrenia, glutathione has been shown to be decreased uh, in prefrontal cortex, but also in other brain regions, and in cerebrospinal fluid. And interestingly, uh, a polymorphism in, uh, the, um, in the genes that encode the main uh, limiting uh, protein for the synthesis of glutathione has been shown to be associated with uh, schizophrenia, meaning that uh, people bearing this uh, polymorphism have a glutathione synthesis decrease. But on the other hand, we have also uh, a lot of studies show that inflammation is also involved in the pathophysiology of schizophrenia. Uh, so, for example, inflammatory uh, mediator factors has been shown to be increased in the brain uh, CSF and blood of patients. Uh, and also, microglia and astrocyte activation has been shown to be increased. And so, these two systems can uh, affect some cells that are particularly uh, sensitive to this kind of uh, insult. And these cells would be, for example, the parvalbumin fast-packing uh, gabaragic interneurons, PV interneurons. Uh, 
So these cells are extremely important for the synchronization of the neuronal uh, network. As you can see here, we have uh, a pyramidal uh, excitatory neuron that will activate uh, PV cells, and these cells will in turn inhibit these cells. And this actually uh, loop of activation inhibition would create uh, oscillation at the uh, gamma frequency uh, levels. And this process is extremely important for uh, gating uh, of information and has been shown to be associated uh, with a cognitive uh, deficit in schizophrenia as it has been described as that PV uh, interneurons are affected. For example, at the uh, PV GAT67 has been shown to be decreased. The perineuronal net, which is extracellular matrix and wrapping PV, has been shown to be also decreased. And these gamma oscillations are also uh, impaired in schizophrenia patients. So the aim of this study was to find a vulnerable time window during which PV interneurons are more sensitive to environmental additional challenge and propose a mechanism uh, by which, which could affect their maturation and explain why uh, the symptoms appear later after a trauma or environmental uh, challenge occur early. And then in the second step, we would like to propose a treatment approach that could be applied uh, also to humans. So as I showed you before, glutathione has been shown to be very important uh, in schizophrenia. So uh, we are working on a mouse model, the GCLM knockout mice, that, has, that actually lacks uh, the, this uh, moderatory subunit of the key synthesizing gene for glutathione, meaning that these mice have a 70% decrease of glutathione and therefore they have increased oxidative stress. And to these mice, we can add an environmental insult um, by inducing increased dopamine, which is a process that has been shown to occur uh, in humans also when there is an external uh, psychological stress or trauma. And actually the dopamine catabolism will lead to more oxidative stress generation. So by this way, we have a mouse model with decreased antioxidant defense and we add even more oxidative stress. So the balance is like this uh, disrupted. And we did this additional challenge with a GBR uh, at different uh, time period of the development. As you see, at juvenile stage, at peripubertal stage, and then in adulthood. To, and we looked in the prefrontal cortex, which is a region that has been shown to be affected in schizophrenia. We looked at uh, PV interneurons. So as you can see here, first we saw that in the GCLM knockout mice, we have increased oxidative stress by this additional um, environmental uh, insult uh, at all stages. And then when we looked at parvalbumin interneurons, you can see here that in the GCLM knockout mice uh, at basal level without uh, this GBR, we have slight decrease of PV, but very early in the development and then very late. But then when we add GBR, for example, at juvenile stage, right after we see a decrease of PV interneurons. It is the same when we apply this stress at peripubertal stage, but no more in adulthood. So this suggests, as you can see also here, this suggests that actually the PV interneurons are more sensitive early during their maturation, but no more in adulthood. And interestingly, as I presented to you before, the evidences uh, for inflammation, we also looked for new inflammation in these mice. And as you can see here, microglia activation is also uh, increased in these mice, uh, in the GCM knockout mice at all developmental stages, even in adulthood. But it is more pronounced early during, um, during early phase. So this, uh, so this suggests that there is this vulnerability period also. So then we could, with this data, we could see that actually the oxidative stress induced these PVI impairments. And with uh, other work, we could see that oxidative stress uh, induced new inflammation by uh, microglia activation. And that new inflammation induced again oxidative stress. And this uh, reciprocal feed forward loop has been shown to, involve, to be involved by uh, a, a pathway that I don't have the time now to present you, but I will present it later in another symposium, uh, 
uh, that implied rage and MMP9. And actually, uh, we found that this mechanism was involved in the maintenance of, uh, of this loop, and we were able to block this by blocking a rage and MMP9. But of course, this, uh, was, this blocking was done with an, uh, a specific inhibitor and cannot uh, or may not be um, used for human. Therefore, we moved for uh, another uh, approach by using antioxidants, as the oxidative stress was shown to be um, the mediator of these uh, impairments. And here, this study was already published. We uh, applied this antioxidant for uh, during gestation already, so to the pregnant dam, and to the pups until P40. And we could see that, as you can see here, the oxidative stress induced by this GBR and the decrease uh, PV interneurons and perineuronal nets all were reversed by this NAC treatment. So this was uh, extremely encouraging, encouraging and uh, were, was a kind of proof of concept to show that the oxidative stress was inducing the PV, uh, PVI impairments and that we could reverse it with an antioxidant. But then we moved to a model that would be more um, relevant for human data, meaning uh, an additional, uh, this additional um, environmental insult very in, uh, in uh, young in juvenile mice, and then waiting until P90, so young adult. And in this case, uh, as you can see here, the PV interneurons are also are affected by the, um, the oxidative stress uh, addition in juvenile stage, but this effect lasts until adulthood, meaning that like uh, if we compare to human data, when we have this trauma uh, in childhood, the effect appear and still are maintained until adulthood. So based on this model, we uh, try to uh, find a translational approach, a, a treatment, to see if we can prevent this long-lasting effect of, on PVI uh, and PNN. So in this model, what we did is, so this oxidative, additional oxidative stress uh, in uh, childhood, and then we added for two weeks this antioxidant NAC. And this with the idea that this antioxidant right after the, the addition of oxidative stress will prevent the oxidative stress and reduce it. And then after this treatment, we, um, we housed the mice in an enriched environment, which means a bigger cage uh, with some toys and a wheel. Uh, and to, because this kind of uh, environment has been shown to stimulate PV interneurons and also reduce microglia activation. And then we waited until adulthood. So with this idea, we had, um, we had the hypothesis that actually antioxidant in parallel to human that can be uh, applied and the environmental enrichment would be the, some uh, cognitive stimulation or psycho, uh, psychotherapy that could be uh, applied um, to patients. And so what we observed, as you can see here, the increased oxidative stress and microglia activation that was induced by the GBR treatment in adulthood was completely reversed by the combination of NAC and environmental enrichment, but also by uh, one or another. And then we moved for uh, PV uh, interneurons. And as you can see here, the decrease of PV and their perineuronal net could be completely prevented and reversed by the combination of both, but not uh, by only NAC treatment or only environmental enrichment. And then based on the work uh, that I mentioned before on this pathway involving RAGE and MMP9, we also looked at MMP9 protein that was already shown to be increased in these animals after this GBR treatment. And as you can see, this was also completely reduced uh, by this, uh, this approach. So to summarize and to uh, propose a translation, in this mouse, uh, in this mouse model with a glutathione deficit, um, so a genetic vulnerability, in combination with a stress, so an environmental uh, insult during development, this leads to long-lasting effect on PV uh, interneurons and their perineuronal nets. Then uh, this uh, stress is 
deleterious during infancy and adolescence, but no more in adulthood, because the vulnerability period of PV interneurons is, all already, um, is already closed. And then these impairments can be reversed by the application of antioxidants and this uh, environmental enrichment when applied after uh, the stress. And so if we compare this to human data, where we can imagine that an individual with a genetic uh, vulnerability uh, that has uh, experienced an environmental insult, such as a trauma, during brain development, so during childhood, uh, this may induce uh, impairment that will last and uh, appear with symptoms uh, in early adulthood. And so as uh, in, para in line with the finding in the mice, uh, if you had the chance to go to the poster of uh, Professor Philip Conius, you could see uh, that we have some uh, promising results with NAC treatment in early, uh, early psychosis patients, uh, where this uh, treatment could improve some cognitive um, deficit, and especially in this individual bearing uh, a risk uh, factor for oxidative stress. So to summarize, we saw that an early oxidative insult induces long-lasting effects on PV interneurons and PNN, which can be reversed by a combination of NAC and environmental enrichment, even after the challenge. And then in analogy, individuals carrying genetic risk to redox dysregulation, potentially vulnerable to early life insults such as trauma, could benefit from a combined pharmacological antioxidant treatment and psychosocial therapy. So I would like to thank, of course, uh, Professor Kim Do, uh, in, uh, with whom I'm uh, working, uh, and all the other lab members that helped me for this study, and of course, the, uh, all the clinicians with whom we are uh, really uh, in touch and collaborat collaborating, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Time for uh, one or two questions. <coughs> it's quite a bit technical, but... Uh. Um, is uh, being born a trauma? Excuse me? Yes. In your model, is being uh, born a, a trauma? Born with a trauma, you mean? Yes. And could you applicate it to having a, a traumatized uh, delivery or so? Uh, to model, so to, to model some uh, the, trauma, the trauma of, uh, of the bone, of the... Um, there are some models that exist for this kind, for example, to mimic hypoxia. Uh, during uh, this uh, phase of uh, bone, and indeed this induced oxidative stress and microglia activation, and also uh, PV interneuron deficit. Uh, we are not working with this kind of model, but this indeed exists. Another question? Uh. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thank, you. Thank you for your talk. So we are developing a model of rat with uh, social stress early, and we use temple as an antioxidant to uh, because the, the model is uh, the increase of BDNF, and uh, so we we could show that the temple T E M P O L uh, could be mm. a reversal uh, thing on, on the same model as you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, indeed. Sorry, and just a second question for. for for the you, and uh, did you look at um, biomarkers between the two groups of uh, kids uh, in the, the early insults or not early insults, looking at uh, antioxidant peripheral markers in the, in the blood of your patients? So, okay. yeah. So, uh, so yeah, for the first, uh, of course, uh, this there are a lot of antioxidant that has been shown uh, to improve uh, decrease of stress and uh, microglia activation. There are also a lot of study about omega-3 that are also antioxidant but also anti-inflammatory. So uh, indeed, this kind of model are really uh, valid for, uh, for this uh, kind of for schizophrenia disease. And for the second question, I would say that 
we are, we are now trying to see indeed, uh, so at the oxidative stress level, if there are some, um, some uh, uh, antioxidant enzymes that are uh, reduced or, uh, so in, uh, the, um, in the blood of patients. And we are also uh, now starting to be interested, of course, in this pathway that, um, that I mentioned, uh, RAGE and MMP9, to see if there could be biomarkers uh, of uh, the disease. So indeed, we, are, we will collaborate on this. Does this answer also the second question? Oh. Yes, we are looking at uh, markers of a consequence of uh, oxidative stress because, you know, it's very difficult to identify enzymes because they are very transient. And the, we look at the number of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids in the membranes ah. of the erythrocyte as an indirect marker of oxidative stress. So the more yeah, the lipid peroxidation yes, of uh, yes. yeah yeah indeed it's also a good way so we in humans we are using some uh, anti we are measuring the activity of antioxidant that has been shown to be uh, reduced in some patients uh, and as I as I showed here the um, oxidative stress marker for mice we are using uh, DNA oxidation actually uh, so it's uh, also very similar so these are the consequences of uh, the ROS indeed. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, for the sake of time, we have to cut down. But there is a symposium starting at 2.45 exactly on this issue of oxidized stress. So uh, it's in uh, room Foscolo at 2.45. So if you, this, it's going to be more technical and basic. But um, I'm a bit biased about these studies, obviously, because uh, I contribute to them. But uh, to, to us, it's really a, an interesting step into trying to really make sense in animal model of what we observe in the clinic. And we're, again, very thankful to the uh, neurobiologists that they accept to look into our domain and to sort of uh, think in the same line, on the same lines we do. So that's very nice. Uh, last but not least, uh, Monica Oss from uh, University of Oslo in Norway. Uh, she works with uh, Ingrid Mele and other people, and she's going to take about, talk about another aspect of the impact of, uh, of trauma more uh, on, the, um, on the neuropsychological aspects and, and bias that you can observe in patients. But. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the possibility to present my data here today. I'm very honored. So, on this slide, I'm presenting some recent data, which we recently submitted, again, showing that patients with a severe mental illness, they report, oh, sorry, I'm new to, new to this. Uh, so, patients with a severe mental illness, they report more childhood trauma experiences compared to our control group. So, about 50%, more than 50% of our patients reported childhood trauma experiences. And here we used a cutoff score of moderate to severe cutoff score from Bernstein. We also here corrected for potential differences in minimization style in the patients and controls, and also after correcting for potential differences in minimization style, we found that the patients will really reported much higher levels of childhood trauma. And here are some recent data on, in, in the first episode, the COSA sample, and here we had um, two groups. The blue group here are the patients without childhood trauma. The green group are patients with childhood trauma. On the horizontal axis, we have baseline, and then after one year, and then on the vertical axis, we have GAF scores. And what we saw was that patients with childhood trauma had lower GAF scores during the first, oh, during the first year of being treated for psychotic illness, and after one year, they improved. They improved less than the group without childhood trauma. So this really indicates that patients with childhood trauma could be a risk factor for having a more severe illness over time. And here is the recent data we also published showing that patients with childhood trauma have an earlier age of onset, and the more childhood trauma experiences, the earlier is the age of onset. And here is some recent data uh, we just submitted, and here we looked at childhood trauma and affect liability. And what we found was that the patients with the high levels of childhood trauma, they had more mood swings. 
So what are the mechanisms? So in this specific study I will present today, we wanted to test whether atypical processing of emotions and a negativity bias can be a link between a history of childhood maltreatment and illness severity in patients with a psychosis continuum disorder. So our study hypothesis. So high levels of childhood maltreatment will be related to a rating negative faces as more negative and rating positive faces as less positive. And secondly, altered differentiation in brain responses to negative and positive faces. So 101 patients were recruited as part of the thematically organized research study, the top study in Oslo, Norway. The mean age were around 30, and about 50% were males. And we used the childhood trauma questionnaire, and for this specific study, we used the overall total score, and uh, ranging from five to 125, and as you can see, the childhood trauma score uh, uh, is measured from never true to very often true, and it measures physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, emotional neglect, and physical neglect. And for this specific study, we then focused on the total score, but we also did follow-up analysis dividing into subtypes. And for the fMRI paradigm, we used the face-matching paradigm by Hariri, and um, which lasted for about 300 seconds, and we used a free surface software. So here's an example. So the participants were shown um, here negative faces, so they were asked which of these faces here are similar to the face on the top. So this one is similar, right? And the same here, which one of the faces here on the bottom are the same as the face on the top? And then they were asked to do the same also for positive faces. So again, which of these faces at the bottom are the same as the face on the top? And again here, which one on the bottom are the same as the one on the top? And so on. And then we had shapes. So they were asked which of the which of the, the, the shapes on the bottom are the same as the one on the top? So the data I will present reflect the contrast between the negative relative to positive faces. After scanning, the participants were instructed to assess the facial expressions on a laptop, rating the images, on a scale from one to nine. Nine being very negative, sorry, one being very negative and nine being very positive. So we mainly used, we mainly analyzed the CTQ as a continuous variable, but we also did follow up analysis dividing into high and low trauma. And we used a non-parametric permutation testing for the fMRI data, and as well as a threshold-free cluster enhancement, which was performed, which does not require a predefined voxel-level cluster-forming threshold. And here are our results. So on a scale from one to nine, patients with childhood maltreatment reported positive faces as less positive. So when they were shown these different pictures that I showed you earlier of negative faces and positive faces and shapes, when these are positive faces, they experience these faces as less positive than the patients without childhood trauma. On the other hand, negative faces, as this one here, for example, as an example, patients with childhood trauma rated this face as more negative. So when they saw negative faces, they rated them as more negative. 
So we found this data really interesting. So we think perhaps this could be some sort of a negativity bias in these patients. Perhaps they experience the world around them a little bit more negative, in a little more negative fashion. Perhaps that could be a vulnerability for later psychopathology in vulnerable individuals. And here to the fMRI paradigm. So when we looked at the negative versus positive contrast, we found an, incre an increased activation of specific two clusters, with increased activation for negative phases and reduced activation for positive phases. So again, we think that this may indicate that these patients pay more attention to negative stimuli and perhaps less attention to positive stimuli. This graph is quite complex, but I'll try to walk you through it. So the blue line represents the patients without childhood trauma, the green line represents the patients with childhood trauma, and here on the horizontal axis, we have the negative phases versus forms, then we have the positive phases versus forms, and then on the vertical axis, we have the cluster one. And what we found here is that the patients with high levels of childhood trauma they had an increased activation of this cluster and a reduced activation for positive phases. On the other hand, the group without childhood trauma, there was no difference in activation. So again, we think this could support this hypothesis of an increased attention to negative stimuli and reduced attention to positive stimuli. And we see the same here for cluster two. So again, the blue line represents the patients without childhood trauma, the green line represents the patients with childhood trauma, and then on the horizontal axis, we have the negative phases versus forms, and we have the positive phases versus forms, and then on the vertical axis, we have the cluster two. Again, we see the same finding. So patients with high levels of childhood trauma, represented by the green line, when they see negative phases, here, this, um, cluster is then activated, but it's reduced when they see positive phases. Well, we see no difference in the patients without childhood trauma. So again, what this could indicate is an increased attention to negative stimuli. So to conclude, in our study, patients with childhood maltreatment seem to have a negativity bias in the assessment of valence of faces. They have an increased brain responses to negative faces and reduced responses to positive faces. And patients with childhood trauma could pay attention, more attention to negative stimuli and less attention to positive stimuli. And this could potentially be one link between childhood trauma experiences and later psychopathology. We thank the patients who took part in this study and the, and the top study researchers who contributed to the data collection. This study was founded by grants from the University of Oslo and the Research Council of Norway and a specific thanks to Oh, it jumped really fast. Let's go back. A specific thanks to Lars Vestli, Christine Brann, or Carolina Koppi, and the, and the rest um, of our authors here for extremely uh, wonderful help um, for the fMRI data and, and for, for, for help with, with this uh, study and uh, the normal uh, top group. And I would be delighted to try to answer uh, any questions. So if you want to hear more about our study, please contact me after the session. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. We do well with time, so we've got uh, five minutes for questions. Questions? Uh, do, do you think this could pave the way to treatment? I mean, do, do yeah, it could potentially. Uh, yeah, I it think. Uh, yeah, I think this is very uh, uh, promising and, and could potentially be uh, used in in some sort of treatment to try to to um, counteract this negative bias that we think this patient may have. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Any comment? General questions? No, we don't have to fill in all the time. So if, if there's no question, uh, thanks a lot to all the, yeah, ah, yeah wait, question. Oh. Yeah. Uh, ju just to be annoying, uh, I? I'd like to re suggest the hypothesis that trauma is overrated. Okay. And the trauma might be a marker for a problematic child, uh, mother-child interaction. And, and I think of the work of Dr. Fisher with the effect of trauma by the mother is particularly harmful. But uh, there's a whole universe of uh, you know, p potential effects of n problems in the early relationship. And that would also line up with the idea that the earlier trauma is more severe than later. So it may not just be that my mother hit me. It was what about the relationship between myself and my mother rather than the event. So I'm curious about your thoughts about this, you and, and the other presenters. Yeah, maybe I think a very good question. I see that Helen has some comments. Maybe she can answer first. Do you want to? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, this is one, I think, in the same way that we think uh, in genetics about it's never going to be one gene, it's going to be thousands of genes multiply, multiplying together to make an effect. It would be the same really with environments as well. I mean, yes, it's one, trauma would be one thing a child's experience is, it's more likely to occur if they're in a low socioeconomic status, family, in a family that's um, where one of the parents has a mental illness or has substance abusing. As it, there is lots of environments, and I think some of the work uh, one of my students showed um, the day before yesterday was also that these people also, if you're directly victimized, you're also often in a neighborhood that's particularly problematic, and that wider environment is also having an, you know, an accumulative impact on you. So I think you're right. There, we're, we're focusing on one thing, and, and hopefully we'll control for some of those other things, but there is likely to be a, a real cumulative adversity of different things, and, and or, as well as on the background of a, you know, a genetic effect and, and other biological and psychological processes. So yeah, absolutely, but it's an important point. In terms of uh, the earlier or late trauma, I think that many, probably many of the patients that were exposed to trauma early was more in, a, in, a, in, a, in traumatic experiences in, in between the link with their mother, so the bounds that, are, that have a strong uh, impact in the, in the attachment uh, capacities. So, so I think that maybe these, these patients were traumatized by their mothers are in, the, in these relationships. I think it's, it's, it's a very important thing in terms of the attachment, the bones. And Mm -hmm. no, I, I think it's a, but I think it's a general comment for any research you do. I mean, you look at a var variable. There's dozens of others. We try to control for what we can, and it's it's a bit short just to say they've been abused once or whatever, and it doesn't cover the complexity and richness of interactions. But I mean, you can hope that it it's the same for all the patients. So if this element comes out and you control for the ones you can control, still there's difference linked to this point. But that's a limitation of any research, I would say. So, but you're right. I mean it. Um, it's good to remind that because sometimes we sort of focus on one aspect and we explain the world according to that and it's much more complex, so you're right, I think. Okay, this time it's time. Thanks a lot for attending and thanks a lot for the speakers and have a good time and maybe move to the other session if you're interested in oxidative stress. <laughs>